to the podcast. I'm Paul. And I'm Mark. So we finally had some good fishing. We did, yeah. It's been yeah. getting hot. Yeah, the water's uh, warming up, Paul. And no, that the, fishing's, has a... the fishing's been getting hot. Yeah, well, like I said, that that's because the water is warming, warming up, up a little bit and stuff. So I'm kind of anxious to uh, give it a try this week, maybe next week, up on the lakes. Yeah. Should be good. Water should be in the 50s and stuff and should be good fishing. We're about a week ahead. Yeah. Than normal years. Yeah. Usually we were talking about it the other day. Usually my apple trees blossom. And you said growing up. Same thing with you. Your Memorial Day weekend, the, the yeah, apple was, trees. I always mark the uh, uh, apple trees blossoming by Memorial Day yeah. weekend. That's when they, yeah. yeah so and we knew we had an early, and I've talked to farmers and stuff, Paul, and they're way ahead of the game this year. Because it's, uh, we not only had an early spring, we had a dry spring. Yeah. So they could get on the ground early. So, yeah. Yeah. So in regards to fishing, that's where this podcast is going to go. Can you predict good fishing? Yeah. I guess in hunting too. Yeah. You, you know, know, that's all, uh, you know, I, you, you gave me a few days heads up on that, Paul, and that's all. And I was pretty vague about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, said, well, we'll you talk know, that's about, all, that's can you all predict? rhythms, you know, that, uh, you know, you, you know, I thought about it and, and where you fish and how you fish changes from month to month or even sometimes week to week, you it know. It does. Well, there's a lot of factors that play. There's a lot of factors that play into that, and the factors generally follow the same cycle year after yeah. year, you know. The 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 water's cool and the smelt are running early, and you, you catch fish in certain areas in a lake. And then the the window for the smelt run is, is fairly small, and then you have a, a lull. Then as the water warms up, you start catching fish again and yeah. in different places. And uh, as the water really warms up, then you change your tactics completely, go yep. deep. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's uh, and like you say, hunting is the same way where, where you may hunt early. If you were a bow hunter in, in October, you know, would it's may not be where you would hunt in November. Come November. So it, uh. What made me think of it was, so we give out calendars at work. Yeah. And it's like a, like Norman Rockwell right. paintings or whatever. And people really like them. But in the, in the calendar, it has days to go fishing. And so many, like, it'll have like a half a fish mm -hmm. for like, that'd be, you know, I guess like a minor event and a full fish for kind of a major event for, to go fishing. And a lot of people call, I don't ever pay attention to it. Never, right. never really cared. Kind of always felt it was probably more of a gimmick than mm -hmm. anything. And some people are always like, oh, yes, these calendars have the good days to go fishing. So someone brought, mentioned it the other day, and I'm like, I got I to gotta look into that to see what's behind that. Um I didn't know much about it. You ever heard of the soul lunar theory? Yeah, they. Yeah. they I, I suspect it's going off that. I didn't actually look it up, right? But I suspect for sure, it's, and that's the same with uh, deer hunting too, yeah. Paul, and the uh, all moon phases for the moon phases and stuff. Deer. And uh, and it's and it's funny you mentioned that. I just listened to another. It was a very good podcast. They had a a wildlife biologist who really uh, concentrated on white tailed deer and. And uh, he said that because uh, there's two trains of thought yeah. on that, that one is length of day, yeah, and the other is moon phases as far as the uh, you know as far as the rut. And he said 100 yeah. percent it has to do with length of day with uh, photo photo period photo period. Yeah, yeah. So, November 19th up here, he said is the yeah year in and year out is I I, I gotta go. With, I would agree with yep. photo period. There's so many things in biology that are dictated by, mm -hmm. the, I mean, there's so many things by the photo period and, uh, and rhythms and e even in us, circadian rhythms, right. stuff like that. There's so many things right. that are, and there's a lot of hormones that are released according to day and night. Um, uh, there's so many that I can think of off the top of my head that are influenced by that stuff. And, um, uh, but I could see where moon phases could play a role because there's more, there's varying degrees of light. Yeah. 
And like, for instance, the pineal gland plays a role in like melatonin release and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And that's receptive to light. Um, but yeah, I think like the photo period plays a big role, but that's where that, that so lunar theory comes in is it's actually, actually it plays off the position of the moon and the sun in relationship to each other. Right. And the length of, of day and night. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of a multifaceted thing. And I suspect in the calendars and I could be wrong, but I, I suspect in those calendars, they're basically going off, um, the position of the sun and moon right in relationship to each other and you'll see that with like tides yeah um you'll get so tides are affected by the moon and and we're 70 percent water every object exerts a force and the relationship where the moon is in position or where the moon is in relationship to the earth is basically where we get our tides yeah and if you get the sun and the moon in a certain position with each other, you can actually get an exceptionally high tide mm-hmm. and low tide. And uh, so, which can affect fishing mm-hmm. but for coastal fishermen, uh, tidal waters. Um, but yeah, I, I suspect that's going off that. And so, I, I don't know, you know, if I would solely put all my eggs in that basket. Because if you think of all the things that affect good fishing, yeah. Weather, water temperature, you know, weather in general. Right. So barometric p- pressure mm-hmm. can play a role. Um, a lot of people will say like when there's a front coming through, when there's a change mm-hmm. in pressure, particularly going from high pressure to low pressure, they'll say that fish activity yeah. is increased. Um, and that the poorer fishing is kind of when it's more predictable, but the kind of the average fishing is when barometric pressures are steady mm. when you get a change in pressure that can mm. influence how the fishing is yeah rain you know if the water gets muddied up that's poor fishing you know yeah some watersheds are really susceptible to that now not so much a lake paul there again but uh brooks and streams the, and rivers our local river yeah i can remember yeah. growing for, up for sure you could be washed out you'd have yeah. two or three you'd get a big thunderstorm yeah and it didn't have to be a very long thing. It could storm, be chocolate milk brown. But and it would be so disappointing because I yeah. a lot of my childhood or high school years were spent going on the river. And I could be so disappointed when we would have yeah. a big thunderstorm. Because there'd be a good three days that you couldn't fish. Right. And it has that has to do with all the agricultural land yeah. along the river. Yeah. It's all farmland. They've got farms along, along the, the fields river. right up to the Right up to the riverbanks, and that fishery too, Paul. Like, like a lot of them in the in the rivers and stuff. That uh, you had a window when the water was warming up, but hadn't got to a temperature that it had driven the the trout into the spring holes. Because yeah. once they get in the spring holes, they get a lot tougher to catch. You oh, know? wicked! And uh, so there was a period in May and maybe early June that you had good fly fishing when the when the the fish were active. And feeding throughout the river, yeah, and uh, that, all that through was, the river. That was your and that and like I say, that window could be short, yeah, depending on how how fast it get warm. So, yeah. which I've been meaning, I I want to fish the river more. Yeah, I used to fish it all the time, and I don't remember the last time. Yeah, and it has. I just talked to a guy not too long ago. He caught a twenty inch brook trout out of it. Yeah, and we would catch brook trout every year that were eighteen, nineteen. 20 inches, a handful of them a year Yeah, that were, yeah, no, and you would see some, and you talk about once it warms up and they go into the spring holes, you yeah. could see them. Yeah. They just get a lot harder, tougher spring, to catch. You just, yeah. they were hard tougher to catch. Game. And tougher. I can remember there was one, one summer he would every now and then a great big humpback and he would come up out of the water Yeah, and, uh, taking something, but it was pretty sporadic. Yeah. And you'd be sitting there fishing, and every now and then you'd see him come up, and you'd just be like, "Oh, boys, yeah. that's yeah. a big trout." Yeah, never could catch them. No, no, they're they very were... tough to catch in in the spring hole. So, but you know what? We always went, no matter what. Yeah. So still, come July, you're still fishing. We know water's warm. Yeah. Fish are in the spring holes. Yeah. We may not catch anything, but we we just wanted to go fishing. Right. 
And so that kind of brings kind of full circle to that, you know, predicting good fishing and whatnot and picking days where you're going to catch fish. But I'm, I think for me, and I've kind of said it a lot before, I'm any day that I have available to go fishing and I'm dedicated to it. I'm going to go fishing, whether right. it's, you know, hell or high water, I'm right. going to go. Yeah. And that's what you do. You know, you have limited days at uh, limited opportunities, so you got to make the most of them and you go, you go regardless and uh, you, you t- try to adapt to the conditions, you know, go where yeah. you think you can catch trout and under those conditions. And, uh, and yeah. even then though, it's not always about catching fish. No. Because I, I like to, you know, if we're up spring fishing mm. and the fish are deep, I like to fish with a fly rod. Right. With a streamer. Right. And I could probably catch fish, you know, with a downrigger going whatever depth they're at, but mm-hmm. oftentimes opt not to just because I want to fish with a right. fly rod. And if that's it's a the way nice you day. prefer to do it. It's like somebody who bow hunts or whatever, yeah. that's, it may be a little more difficult and they may be less successful, yeah. but they, that's the way their preferred method. And yeah. yeah, yeah, we do that stuff. I, I love catching fish on a fly rod. Yeah. Like paddling a canoe, you know, it's not a, you're not going to get around as fast as paddling a canoe as you are in a motorboat, but yeah, sometimes we, we choose that, uh, that method. So, so yeah, the, the, uh, you know, predicting good fishing days from a calendar, it's great to, I guess, if you're yeah. retired and have all the time in the world, yeah, then you can pick and choose. Yeah. But then you got to ask yourself, is it just about catching fish? And right. Sometimes, because we talk about this a lot too, that, uh, you know, usually have one or the other, good weather and bad fishing or yeah. bad weather and good fishing. Yeah. The two don't usually line up. And Well, the, the thing about uh, some of our fishing, Paul... Uh, the good weather days up on the small ponds fly fishing are the best days to fish in the evening. Those are the evenings well, that you have the hatches and the calm weather, and it was clear. And That's where it's, it's so, becoming their, they're being linked to their food source at yeah. that point yeah. in time. That's, yeah. that, that's a predictor of the good fishing, yeah. if there's a good hatch. Yeah. Which typically those small ponds, we're looking at second, third week of June. Yeah. What years ago, and I don't know if it's changed any with the change in our weather patterns or not, but I can remember guides, uh, up in the North main woods, June 18th yeah. was, was the number that they used to throw out for peak, uh, like hatches and, yeah. and fly fishing the small ponds. And it's funny, Paul, because that we're talking about rhythms and there's dates that you can go you know, and I remember people talking about fishing the lakes, and uh, that was about the same time for trolling up in the lakes that it was they, they really turned on. Like uh, for salmon and trout, was they always said Father's Day weekend, which is in, okay. in that yeah. in that area. And then then you had another, you know, the Fourth of July was a hex hatch. Yep. There's there's markers throughout the year yeah. that people have that. Uh, the first of May was a smelt run, you yeah. know, and it ended the first week of May, you know, late, late April started the smelt run. And then the that first week of May, it yeah. ended. That was a marker, you know, try to try to be in certain places on the lakes at that time, at the mouth of uh, brooks that smelt were running in. Yeah. So like I say, there's, there's a rhythm and there's markers to, uh, to uh, different types of fish and different, different uh, lakes, ponds, Yep. streams you know i mean life's life's a great big rhythm it is with everything it is it's, same with deer hunting too yep. you know and uh and hunting in general so experience speaks volumes when it comes to that stuff because there are days that for maybe you can't articulate it to someone but you get up and you're just like this this is a good day to be out yeah fishing or this is a good day, day to be out hunting yeah like that morning I get up to meet you to go fishing. I, it just had, I don't know, the smell. And it's probably just going from yeah. our our memories, our memory kind of internalizes all that. Yep. And even though you may not be at the forefront cognitively, you know, on on what's going on, you just kind of get up and you're like, you know, yeah, yeah you've, you've experienced this all before and had good fishing. 
And it just felt like one of those days. It was the smells, the kind of damp, dank air. Right. Um, and I suspect that day we had good fishing. Yeah, there was, I think there was a front coming through. You could see yeah. kind of a line off in the distance. We had some showers. Yeah, we had, and yeah, stuff. We had some showers. Some, it was cloudy and, uh, yeah. and obviously overcast and, and a little chop on the water. Right. Hides the boat. Yeah. And all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, that plays a role. But the same thing goes for hunting. You know, there was uh, our deer camp week that Thursday. That was a deer killing day. Mm. You know, those days, you know, kind of the foggy, yeah, calm, quiet. There was water dripping off the trees. Yeah. It just had a real, like, oh, this is a day that you yeah. you get it done. And, and if you think back, you know, you cognitively aren't like explaining all the reasons why it's a good day to shoot a deer but you you, you just know. you just feel it and you think back of all those times at deer camp where you would have like multiple guys in camp shoot deer yeah. there's particular types of days that yeah that, that you, thanksgiving day success. last year 2023 was a, a really good day oh Paul, that was to, a day that was to, uh you know and some of you you read about some of the the real experienced good hunters that uh and we've used them a, a lot for reference. The Benoits there, there's a lot of days they they didn't really even hunt. No, it, they, they yeah. didn't. They waited. Yeah, they would wait until the until the time was right, until conditions were right before they they hunted. If you as have far all, as serious hunting, yeah. If you have the entire month to hunt, yeah. And I mean, especially if because I mean it it takes a lot out of you tracking deer, especially it does. if you go hard. Yeah. You know, why not save yourself for right. the good times? Yeah, you can you can burn yourself out somewhat, you know, and yeah. not be as focused if you've done it, if you've pushed hard on marginal or poor days to hunt, and then when a good day comes along, you 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 know you'd be a lot sharper and more raring to go yeah. if you hadn't hunted as much the, prior to that day. So yeah. Now, for someone who finds themselves in like my shoes, who's working. You get a day here yeah. or there, you know, it's, if whatever you're referencing is, you know, is this a good day to hunt or a bad day to hunt? Well, for me, any day I can get out, it's a good day to hunt. Right. And hunting and fishing's kind of a cognitive reprieve for me, kind yeah. of a, a break from. But even, but even those days, Paul, we'll go sometimes on, you know, if it's 70 degrees and which happened last year. Yeah. And we don't take the, we may go out and we may do some scouting and look around, but we certainly don't no. hunt to the intensity that we would if it was a, a killing day. No, but I, I enjoy those days. And actually I thought right. about that they're, day. They're less stressful than stuff. When I was doing they're this, enjoyable, but when I was thinking about stuff for this podcast, I thought of that day and how days like that are still valuable to me. Cause I remember sitting down on the edge of a cot and it was hot. Mm. And, 70. It yeah, rained. I think it was pushing 80, wasn't it? Yeah, wasn't well, it? it was in the 70s, so it was, yeah. And I can remember I just picked a stump, and I wasn't really, like, picking a spot where I thought a deer was going to come out. Yeah. The sun was beating down. Yeah. I could see down across this cat, and there was kind of birds chirping, and I just yeah. kind of sat there and had a snack. and sat there for probably 30, 45 minutes. Yeah. And, it, I mean, that was enjoyable. Right. Just kind of chilling out there. Right. And, Make the most of what you have. And, uh, so. yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, wasn't hunting incredibly hard, but right. I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. Nonetheless. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, any day that I can get out, mm. it's going to be good no matter what. Right. If I'm sitting in the boat fishing and the sun's out and it feels good. Yeah. I'll sit back. Enjoy and, the day. And relax and enjoy the yeah. day. And if I'm not going to, cry if the fishing if i come back skunked right so we adjust so we've got a big fishing trip coming up yeah our big first fly, first fly fishing trip so we, we love to fish dry flies and that's that's something i really look forward to mm. we actually moved it up a week week and a half yeah we yeah we had uh, uh the family had some stuff going on about the middle of june that uh we well had, and we're we're ahead of and we're ahead anyway. We're so, ahead. To, yeah. Yeah. We're ahead as far as weather. Going up the first week of June. Yeah. And I get a lot of people that ask what we use for the setup. And I think we've gone over it before. Real basic, simple but, setup. Paul. Yeah. It's nothing. 
five weight uh, five weight fly line, five weight rods, fly rods. Yeah. Nine foot tapered leader, maybe what six or five or six pound tippet. Yep, I use four X tippet. Yeah, weight forward line. Yeah, Cortland four forty four is what I use. Yeah, for line. full floating. Yep, and uh, nine foot leader. Yeah, nine foot 4X leader tippet. and fluorocarbon. Yeah, and we and we tend to lean towards a, a number twelve atoms. You know, I was talking to a guy about that the other day. He's we get talking about tying flies, and he's like, uh, yeah, he's like, I gotta replenish my flies in my box and i was laughing i was like you know i got so many flies mm. and when you're young and you first start tying you, you want to tie everything under the sun you want to do all the patterns and, and i'm yeah. like there's probably like three yeah. flies yeah that i use all summer long three yeah. patterns not three individual flies but yeah and yeah i, I hardly deviate from them yeah. you know like a size 12 or 14 atoms. Right. And then usually a caddis imitation. Yeah. My other caddis fly. And if you do the hex hatch, you'll want some bigger, yeah. bigger mayflies. And uh, yeah, like a royal wolf. Like our, or, our local river has excellent caddis hatches. Mm. Really good caddis fly hatches. Yeah. And uh, so usually when I'm fishing the river, I probably always will start with an atoms. Right. But, it, you know, if you're observant, see what's going on. And you can tell just from a distance, what's coming off the water by how the yeah. flies fly. You'll see caddis flies kind of skitter and, and flutter across the water, kind of dimpling the water, hitting it right there. on and off. Right. Where, and you'll see trout chasing them yeah. differently than, than say, like a, a uh, mayfly. mayfly. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, usually we start with an yeah. atoms there, and yeah. then I'll end up usually switching to a caddis imitation on the river there, but... I don't do a lot of nymph fishing. I do a little bit of it. I I dabble in it and and great effective way to catch fish. It I mean, is, and I've done a little bit in the ponds and stuff with the sinking line, Paul, and uh, and it, caught fish that way. But we like to fish the evenings with uh, dry yeah. flies. So majority of a fish's diet is subsurface. So yeah, you're really kind of putting yourself a little bit in a box when you just stick to dry flies. But right. there's nothing like nothing more enjoyable. Right, that's I find then generally that that's accepted. That's the most enjoyable yeah. way to yeah. uh, the visual part of it. Yeah, seeing them come up and yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's something too in in your psyche about getting a fish to come up to the surface for your yeah your fly. You feel I think a little more accomplished. Yeah, especially like if you you're, if them. you've uh, created the fly, if you've yeah. tied it and stuff. And that being said, a lot of the ponds that we fish, you probably could put a cigarette butt. On a hook, yeah, and catch a fish, yeah. But a lot of them aren't overly yeah. difficult to, yeah, catch fish, but they can be. Yeah, they can. You're right, they can be, and uh, but generally not so much, not so much. You know that uh, brook trout have a reputation of being fairly unselective, yeah. fairly easy to catch, and but we certainly, as like we were saying in the spring holes, they can be really selective oh, yeah, and stuff. Gosh. They can be really tough yeah. to catch and. Yeah, hard to get them to. Yeah. So. Um, so the other thing, so our spring setup for trolling, I had it. I had some people ask, you know, they've never seen anyone troll with fly rods, hmm. and uh, it's kind of a northeast thing, isn't it? It's a uh, majority very traditional Maine, Paul, and I think it's losing its uh, uh, following or whatever. It was very traditional for Maine to. Uh, for people in Maine in the springtime for trout and salmon to troll with a fly rod with uh, streamers. Yeah, tandem it streamer. Was ve very traditional. The most effective way? Maybe not, you know. Uh, maybe uh, no. a smelt would be, you know. Sound a, smelt? A, 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 uh, sewed on smelt would probably be more effective than, yeah. but we just, it's very traditional and I, I like to do it. We, yeah. Or we like to do it, so... And again, there's nothing like catching a, at least in my opinion, like catching a nice salmon or trout yeah. on a fly rod. Yeah. You really feel. And it can be everything. effective, especially for salmon. Seem to They seem to like streamers. They, yeah, they, they do. They yeah. fly. So they, yeah. It can be very effective. So. So for our, for my setup anyway, I use an eight weight sage. Mm -hmm. um, I use a sink tip fly line. Cortland with, I use a, a 
quite a, I use a level leader with that, but it's a long, probably 15 feet or more yeah. of fluorocarbon leader. And what I use for real, uh, bat and kill. Yeah. So disc drag, but a nice open face. So I don't even use a drag at all. If yeah. You can just apply pressure with your right. hand on the reel to apply yeah. whatever drag you want. Generally, you let all your fly line out, so you want to have some backing, 100 yeah. yards or so of backing on the uh, backing. on the reel. Yeah, you use, I think you still use a five weight, don't you? That you troll. I with? I think I do have a five weight, and I put a. I always use the same thing, a, a floating line with a sink tip. But this year, I put a. a well, it's called a trolling line. Looks like a level fly, a sinking fly line is yeah. what it is, but it doesn't go very deep. It may, it may go a couple, three feet deep yeah. at the most. Well, the problem, so. the reason I'd switched from, because I usually used a full sinking line, mm. but we get into some pretty shallow spots mm. and I'd be hook and bottom mm -hmm. if we got into the, some of the shallow, shallow yeah. areas, which you can, some of those shallow areas hold a lot of fish. Yeah, we were talking about that, Paul. I uh, a few weeks ago, I was up there and I wasn't having much luck on the lake, and and I know that uh, the brook trout can be in real shallow water, yeah. especially salmon, not so much. And I had two rods out. I had a rod with a rapala, and that the rapala rod ran about five or six feet. So okay. I pulled that right in, and I get right into four feet of water and was catching all kinds of trout. Yeah, you caught quite a few, didn't you? Caught quite a few, yeah. And that was just a change in strategy. You know, with the Rapala rod out there, I couldn't get in that close to shore in yeah. that shallow water. But as soon as I reeled that in and, and, and trolled in close to shore in four feet of water, I started catching fish. Those trout, Rapala, Rapalas are good. Rapalas are really, yeah, for We've where always... we fish the... Uh, when I've always fished with it on a, on a rod in a rod holder, my second rod was a gold Rapala. Yeah. Very, very good. So. Some days that's money. Yeah. Yeah. That's Especially funny. the trout really, yeah, they really like the, uh, Rapala, the lures. Yeah. Catch salmon on it too, but salmon tend to gravitate more towards the streamers and stuff. And, uh, yeah. so. Yeah. Which, I mean, no, I got nothing against people that fish with lead core line and stuff like that. No. Nope. But that, that's just not my, not nope. for me. That's kind of a thing with the family too, Paul. My dad never did it. Once the, once yeah. he couldn't catch a fish on top with a fly rod, then he he, was, he was done for the year. Yeah. He was he was done trolling. Yeah. So, of course, now they have downriggers and stuff and all kinds of good yeah. equipment to, to get down get, to where the fish are in the warm weather and stuff. And I do own two of them. I just don't use them very often, so... Yeah, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't intrigue yeah. me. And it's probably the way I grew up doing it. Yeah. I've, so it changes your... You from me and me from dad. And it changes your kind of, Yeah, I guess, your yeah. your view on that stuff. Yeah. Or, or how Some people like are really it. effective with them. Oh, yeah? The, the downriggers yeah. and stuff. Well, I mean, if you get using a fish finder and you're yeah. marking fish at 30 feet, yeah, well, let's go to 30 feet. You can feet. put it right at 30 feet. Yep. With a downrigger yeah. or with lead core, if you know, you know how to use it. Yeah. So yeah. that's, you know, I mean, we don't use a lot of technology fishing either. No. Really? You do have a fish finder in the yeah, boat. Yeah. And it's, I think of that once in a while, Paul. And you know, the fish finder is, and it's a really basic, inexpensive fish finder. And I've had it for a lot of years and I more want it for, it tells me the water temperature. I just was going to say, all I really care about is the water temp. And I carry a thermometer. But so I can, but I like but that. But more gives... relevant or pertinent for me is the depth I'm at. Yeah, that too. Because there's not much I can do about the water temperature. No. If I'm out fishing and it's the water temperature is 44 degrees, it's 44 degrees. Yeah. But, but I can a, change my depth. Yeah. I can go into four feet of water or 10 feet of water or. Yeah. So I more use it for that than. Uh, than anything, but it is good to know to know what the water temp is. I always I, I keep track of that in, in a journal. I always yeah. mark it down. You I have make always, them in handy in in uh, future years and stuff. So. Always kept a thermometer. Yeah. And always would take yeah. take a water temp to see, yeah. but particularly the river, because yeah. I would if I was out in the river and I'm not seeing any fish, and I would take a water temp. And if we're getting into the mid seventies now, yeah, I know they're 
They're in the spring they're holes. They're in the spring holes. Yeah. They're gone. And yeah, I always, even the ponds, I don't, we go up fishing. Usually the first thing I do is, yeah. Oh, what's the water temp? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, Maybe and the ponds and stuff in the evening, if they're, if they're, if it, they get up towards 80, and I've seen them, you know, even in June, middle of June, on a, if you have a warm spell. Oh, yeah. I've seen the water, the surface temperature get up in the eight low 80s, and, the, you know, it's that makes it tough fishing. You may you may have to write it off or whatever, the yeah. dry fly fishing. So. Yeah, just a short window to. Yeah, everything is, uh, like I say, rhythms and, uh, yeah, windows. You have windows here, and, and uh and generally, they're the same year after year, but you, they can change with uh, if you have a, an anomaly in the weather. If, yeah. You know, a heat wave or something comes through, and you've always uh, fished the the ponds in mid June, and I've seen it. I've seen a, a heat wave come through and and uh, put the fish down. Yeah, ruin the fishing. So yeah, you got to pay attention to what's yeah what's going on. Yeah, because if yeah, if you just went by. You know, a set. Right, I did it schedule. here June fifteenth last year. Right, yeah. Things things change year to year. Yeah, you got to be able be able to adapt to what. Yeah. Because uh, another thing this year is there's, the water's low for going this down time fast. Of year. Yeah, we've had a lack of rain, and, and we uh, didn't have any spring runoff. No spring runoff to speak of, and now a dry spring. So uh, the two strikes, and uh, yeah, so that will also mean that it'll uh, warm up quick too, yeah, Paul. that's right. And we've got two, uh, three days in the 80s this week. Yeah. So things can change fast, uh, water temperature and water conditions. And yep. So. But the advantage of a warm, dry spring. The partridge. Partridge. Yeah, that's what I'm, th- and and the, the easy winter on the deer and yeah. stuff. Yeah, for sure. we had a bad... It was bad grouse hunting last year. Yeah, worse than we talked to a, an outfitter uh, just uh, yesterday. Yeah. And he said, and, and I agree 100% with uh, what Jason said. It was the worst I've ever seen. Yeah. I think the entire season, and I shot at least one in November, I think I took either three or four partridge all yeah. season. That is horrendous. Yeah. And it is. I didn't hear anybody give a good report up here. No. Nope. So there's uh, there's there's all kinds of phrases, Paul, that uh, we talk about fishing and stuff. And and I one of the ones that I remember is when when the alder leaves are as big as a mouse's ear. It was time to the fish were biting. Time to yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard that I one. Have, that was a that's yeah. I've seen that written and heard that for many many decades. And there was another one. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I I don't know if I read it someplace. It was a species of vegetation along the riverbanks that would flower. I oh well, yeah I bet for sure there's and I can remember reading it as a kid and I remember thinking yeah. as a kid obviously it's correlating to ground temperature. Yeah. Hence yeah. water temperature yeah. and these old timers and I oh maybe someone will know yeah. but there was a a species yeah. of a vegetation that would flower yeah. and there was and a, that's when they they would be like oh the fishing's getting good there's another one Paul that we can attest to and this uh, when the uh, flies are biting the fish are too yeah, yeah. and yeah. what what have we seen just the last couple of days up black here, flies are out the black mm-hmm. flies are out. In full force. So it would be uh, it would be the time to hit the brooks. Yeah. Right now, the yeah. black flies are out. So that's uh, and those are all markers of weather, you know, temperature and stuff, and uh, so. Yep. And they correlate with uh, with the uh, fish. Yep. So it. Uh, yeah, and then there was one I remember an an old guy that used to come up and fish with Dad. He would say, you know. Wind from the west, fishing at its best. Wind from the east, fishing at its least. So take that for what it's worth. So I guess he liked to fish under a high pressure because that's when the wind's out of the west. That would. But. So yeah, another, well, not next week, the week after next, we'll be out fishing. Yep. It's hard to believe that. Yeah, it's already here. Yeah, it goes, comes and goes so way too fast. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, like I say, Paul, you can, that. That window for that is 
is short June yeah. for fly fishing the ponds, and then it can warm up and it can get tough fishing in the ponds and stuff. In July and August, the dog, dog days of August. I I try to tell myself like, and it happened last year. We had really good fishing one night. You know, it was Tuesday night. We scooted into a pond. That was June nineteenth. Yeah, and I was like, I marked that down on June nineteenth. You know, it's a lot of work. It's gonna be a late night. Yeah, but it's just a a yeah. few days here that I got for really good and fishing you, left. Let's we take uh, advantage of it, and it was worth the trip. We in there. were rewarded that night for yeah. some nice dry fly fishing, Paul. Some Big on quality trailer. fish on on, on nice a dry fish. Fly. And it was a perfect evening. It was calm. The water temperature was right. Yeah. And it was overcast. Yeah. It was, we had everything that uh, that we needed. Yeah. And that was June 19th. And that's where pay attention to the weather comes in too. Because I remember yeah. looking at the weather and going, man, Tuesday night. Yeah. There's no wind in the forecast. Right. And that's a big thing yeah. with, with fishing those ponds is, uh, you know, you, we're always looking for quiet uh yeah no wind and quiet evenings no wind for sure and so it was shaping up to mm. it's like okay we got to take advantage of this and could have gone and not caught anything but yeah it was yeah it was a really good night and i think paul we were the only people on the pond only that night. ones on the pond yeah i don't think there was anybody else on the pond no, so it was a week night but yeah still there's guides and outfitters in that area yeah. but well they're uh, kind of it's kind of funny how that works out because I mean, not funny because they're doing it because people are there for the experience as well and they're paying for a nice dinner and whatnot. Mm. They usually, you know, fly their clients out yeah. back to the camps for dinner. Yeah, they 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 fly them in at 8 o'clock or so in the morning and they're gone by 4.30. Yeah. It's like, ooh. Yeah. yeah. So as a true fisherman, we're not really thinking about being on the water until... 4.30 or 5. Yeah, 6 or so. Because that night we didn't get on the water until 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, yeah. So, yeah. You get a good hour, hour and a half. Of, yeah. But like you say, these people are coming up and they're paying for the experience yeah. and they're they're going to go back and have supper at the lodge. and. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's part of it. And I'm them. sure they catch fish all day long going they, to subsurface. They do. Yeah, they've got the guides that know where to go. And they yeah. do, I'm sure, Paul, they're fishing subsurface yeah. where they... Where they know the fish hang out. But yeah, when I see daytime. people leaving, and it's always been like that growing up, even when I was a kid. I think you would see people fishing on their own, not with a, a guide or anything. And you know, you're you're fishing like five, six in the afternoon, not really catching a whole lot. Yeah. It'd be kind of frustrating and see people leave. Yeah. And I can remember thinking, boys, you're leaving at right when it's about to start getting yeah. getting good. Yeah. And it, especially on those ponds, a lot of the fishing's good when you can barely see. Yeah. Like if if you're looking out at your fly floating and it's like it's gotten so dark you almost have to look off to the side yeah. so you can see the fly in your periphery. And I can remember one night up there we were fishing and I it it was the twenty first, longest day of the year. Mm -hmm. And it was also a full moon, if I remember. And I can remember Fishing, like, I think we were after, it was after 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And I can remember getting the, get the canoe position where the moon was like reflecting off the water. So you could see your vlog. And we had phenomenal fishing. Yeah. That was the latest I think I've ever fished yeah. on a pond up there and been able to keep fishing. Yeah. I can, and I haven't been back in a lot of years, but I can remember a little pond. And uh, we would fish, like you say, the, in the, June twentieth, twenty first, uh, when when it was the longest days of the year, and we'd be right out there after nine o'clock, and uh, right in the rocks, right in onshore, oh, yeah. yeah, and catching fish after fish, yeah, right in the rocks. Those fish yeah. would be would be tucked right up along shore there, taking mayflies. They would never be there, you know, two hours prior. No, nope. you waste your time, but. You you get there like I say at nine o'clock and yeah yeah you can uh, another interesting thing too Paul if the we talk about the cycles and and the the hex hatch up there on some of the bigger lakes and I mean you're talking Fourth of July on these lakes and the water's in the seventies yeah and there's no way that a a salmon or a trout would want to be up at the surface 
no. in 70 degree water, but they will come up because those uh, the opportunity for those taking those flies, yeah. the hex hatch, brings them up. Yeah, they they'll put up with the warm water just to, for the feed. Yeah, those are big mayflies. Yeah, yeah, those that's a situation right there big where mayflies. you know you wouldn't ever think that a uh, a salmon or a trout was going to be taken on the surface. 4th of July, 1st of July yeah. in 70 degree water, 75 degree water, but they will, uh, they'll put up with the warm water just to, to, uh, feed on those flies. You can try to fish it this year? I, I, my intention is to I try I think you it. say that every year. It, I do. And, but we have done it. So yeah. the, uh, probably the, would be to go up into the woods and try some of the other ponds during that hex hatch pool, yeah, if, we, nice could, if we could do yeah. that. Yeah, we'll try that. Yeah, I'd like to. Like I say, I've said it a lot of years past. I'd like to do it, and then, you know, something just did, haven't yeah, taken the time to. But, man, yeah. and some of the places that I've talked about that were once really good with that hex hatch have gone by the wayside. Yeah. I think they still do, and you may still be able to go up and catch a, a few fish. And there still are a few flies coming off, but I don't think it's anything like it used to be no. 30 years ago, no. 40 years ago. No, you're right. So but I think up in the big woods, they still do. They still yeah. have some the big hex hatches. And Predicting good fishing is pretty multifaceted. It is. I thought the sole lunar theory, I mean, I've, I've read about it in the past, but... When I was looking at those calendars, you know, you're like, oh, people are always talking about this. What's yeah. the, and I got to suspect that's what that's. Yeah. That's I can say this, so. Paul, I've known about them. Uh, and I think I've even known calendars that show, you know. When yeah. And you're and, probably just like. But I, I have paid zero attention yeah. to it. I, you know, when the ice goes out the 1st of May, I'm going to be on the water. Yeah. Uh, I want to be on certain lakes, you know, from early June to mid June and and I'm going to be there. Yeah. And I'm going, you know, and I'm going to be on certain ponds in the middle of June to fly fish and regardless of what the uh yeah. the solar and lunar tables say, I'm yeah. I'm going to be there. I'm going to go. Yeah. And if the and I believe that if the water temperature is right and and I'll catch fish. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. If the water temperature is right for that, I'll you yeah. know for fly fishing or for trolling or for whatever, I'll I'll catch fish. Yeah, yeah there's a whole, so. whole host of factors to consider. Yeah, yeah, that play in regarding if you're having good fish, gonna have good fishing or not. Yeah, and then I guess at the end of the day, for me, I'm not too worried about. No, you're gonna the, go the anyway fin- and have the good a good fishing's time. A bonus. And, yeah, if we don't have good fishing, yeah. I still had a good time. Yeah. It, yeah. It served its purpose for me. Yeah. So, yeah, then we got Memorial Day coming up. That's, uh, of course, it's uh, next weekend. Next weekend. Or this coming weekend. We're, yeah. we're into this week already. It's Sunday, so it's... Uh, it's where we honor those that have died. Exactly. That is Serving. Yeah, the men and women have, in the service that have given their lives for the, yeah. the country. Yeah. For the freedoms we enjoy. Maybe go to camp. Maybe do some fishing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I got to yeah. get, on top of that, I got to get that canoe done. Yeah. I was planning on fiberglassing today, but. I wish I was here to help you, Paul. Lord. The, the, the well, I don't lore, think I'm going to be able to do it today. because The lore of the camp and the lakes yeah, is, is too no. great. I can't. Uh, I've been, so here's the deal with the canoe. I, I, they've been, this is the phase of building a canoe that you can, well, waste a bunch of money. It doesn't turn out right, but the bigger thing with me is all the work I put into the canoe. Mm. If you go to a epoxy it, and fiberglass it, and you can ruin it. Yeah, and all your all your work's gone all down for the naught. drain. And uh, I've worked a fair amount with epoxy, building fly rods, mm. and I've pushed the envelope, done it when I probably shouldn't have, mm. and had a finish not come out the way right. it should. And had to cut all the guides off yeah. and redo the whole thing. Yeah. And that sucks. So yeah. I'm being extra careful. I probably am being overly cautious, but I was waiting for the temps to come up. 
So we had good temps. Right. That's kind of that sweet spot. But today is gonna would be a good day to do it. But the relative humidity is like eighty five percent, right? Ninety percent, and it's too humid. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to risk clouding the epoxy. Yeah, have something not finish the way it should. Yeah, that would be a lot bigger job than taking oh. the, the eyes off a fly rod yeah, or I'd, whatever. Paul, I'd so. have to start over. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah, you don't want to do that. So I'm being extra cautious. So yeah. I want to be, I really wish I had a condition space to, yeah, to right. work in. I, 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 exactly. I will someday. When we yeah. move from here, I will have a yeah. a shop that's. Right. You can control the the, the environment. Moisture and, and yeah. Because, yeah, wintertime, as far as that's concerned, winter's, you know, dry. Right. Great time to, to do this stuff. Plus you have a lot more time. Yeah. To work on that stuff. Because, I mean, look, it's, the days are getting longer. You want to be outside. Nice said I don't. Even like yeah. I almost thought about today. I'm like, we ought to do the podcast outside. Yeah. Not that it's that nice, but yeah. We get the winter's long and I just yeah. want to spend as much time outside as possible. Yeah. They are. And you're absolutely right. When you get a good days like today, you you don't want to be spending inside no. doing inside no. work and uh so no. Yeah. So yeah, the I will find some days to get that done here. Yeah. Because once I, if I get a couple days back to back, I can basically, well, if I do three coats of epoxy, yeah. I basically could do it the outside in three days, yeah. which would be a lot less work for me because there's two methods you can go about when you're, when you're adding if epoxy you do it upon in a window, epoxy. You don't have to sand, no, right, Paul? You, you can go with a chemical bond. Exactly. Which is actually way better than like a physical bond. Like right. if you having it cure the, and then have to sand it yeah, and then reapply. Because yeah, more time to sand it. Yeah. Get rid of the dust. Yeah. The yeah. the epoxy I'm using actually has a three day window to get a good chemical bond. Is that Reka? Did you go with Reka? Raka, I think they Raka, pronounce yeah. it. But yeah. yeah, yeah that's the one I used 70, on my... 72 hours. Yeah. If I do a second coat within 72 hours, I don't have to sand. Um, beyond that, I'll have to sand. And and so if I get a couple yeah. days, so in theory, I mean, I could just, I mean, I could do, and in fact, they say probably the best time to do it is when you put your finish on or your epoxy on and it hardens enough to where you can't spread it around anymore. But if you could just dent your... Thumbnail right. into it. Soft. You can yeah. go ahead and and do another one. Yeah. And then save your sanding for you've done all your epoxy work. Then you can sand everything. Still off. a lot of work though. But then you got to do I don't know how many coats of uh, polyurethane you'll put on. But you'll I don't know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You'll put on then more than more than one for sure. I don't. know. I'll probably th- do at least three. Yeah, so that I mean, all that takes time, and you you get the inside and the outside. You there's still a lot of work left yeah. to. But I uh, I just need that. Need and the weather and to extra hands would be a big help, and your mother is really good with yeah. A paintbrush or working with that stuff. Working with that, yeah, rolling and stuff. Yeah. That uh, she she would be a. The only problem is we're not around much. So no, <laughs> she's hard to pin down, or we're That's hard fine. to pin down. But yeah, yeah, get that done. I can't wait to use it. Yeah, can't wait to try it out. Yeah, yeah. I've, I'm I'm planning. I I, I got to get my. Uh, yeah, you my, built a square stern. Yeah, I got to get that out. I've got my gas tank. I'm gonna on my way. When I leave here, I'm gonna stop at the gas station, put gas in the gas tank, and I'm gonna get that boat out. Maybe here. Memorial Day weekend. We'll take I'll it out have trolling. it out Memorial Day weekend, Paul. Because that solves. I mean, that makes it easy to go in through the thoroughfares and stuff. Yeah. You can go anywhere you want. Yeah. Oh, I'm, no uh, my plan is to, I put the stickers on it the last time I was at the camp. It's all registered. I My plan is to have it in the water yeah. here this week, uh, Memorial Day weekend. So Someone was asking me, and I didn't know because I've never built a square stern, but you, you built a Grand Laker, which yep. is a square stern. They were kind of asking questions about, because they're building a square stern, and they're asking me how, because um, you use the, isn't that, on your square stern, the last station 
is your is your square stern square stern is your transom yeah yeah and so he was asking me about that like how do you taper it and how did you know and i'm like i i've never built one so well I, the I way you taper it is let's say that that's the i don't know what number it was if it was the last station it gives you the dimensions to cut that out okay and then you put it on the strong back and it, it it tapers to that whatever size. Okay, that, you didn't actually taper the the uh, wood on it. Like you didn't. You didn't. Uh, the, the, what's uh, what I'm looking for? You didn't actually. I guess put an angle. You just left it square. Or? Square. Yeah. So you didn't. You didn't adjust for the taper of the strips coming into nope. it, so they all fit flush. Yeah. Uh, and how yep. thick was it? You used oak, right? I did, and I'm trying to think, Paul. Was it three inches? In, no. In, inch and a no. half? Inch and a half, I think. All right. Two at max, inch and a half, yeah. I think. I actually think I took two three-quarter inch and laminated them. Okay. I I'll think. Put an inch and a half. And, and cut it out and, uh, and like I say, put it on as the last station and then. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. Which is, how old is that? That canoe must be 30 years old now. 25 years? Yeah, I think you're, yeah, I've, I've, it's always sat outside, Paul, but I've always made sure that it was covered well because they yeah. wouldn't last long no. in the weather. No. It, you know, I've seen people that have left them in the weather. They don't last no. long. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've made sure that uh, it's been covered and, and I think, yeah, 30 years anyway. I think I was in high school. Yeah. When you did yeah, it. I think it's been 30 years since I, I built it. Huh. Seems like yesterday. Yeah. As did this podcast go by fast. I think we're about an hour into it. Yeah. That's two o'clock. Yeah. You probably want to go to camp, huh? I was packing when... I had uh, a feeling, that's why, because you're like, we'll have to do it after one. And I was like, okay, yeah. one o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. I don't no, think you want to be dilly uh, I was, uh, I got home from church at 1230 and I spent 15, 20 minutes packing my stuff. And I told your mother, I said, you can take your vehicle and go up right now, and I'll be up when I get out of the podcast, or you can wait for me, and we'll we'll probably take separate vehicles there. So yeah. she has the, the flexibility to come you and just, go. As, yeah, you just send her up so she can get everything situated. Not much to situate, Paul. So you get there and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I, yeah, I couldn't it's make it's it. It's not like she has to heat the place up too yeah. much, you know, that... Uh, I told her to leave everything. I'd bring it up. I'd go through, you know, the the uh, fridge and the freezer and bring what I needed, and not to worry. Yeah. All she would have to bring is her clothes. She doesn't have to. She doesn't have to do too much. So. All right. Yeah. Well, I still got three yards of mulch to go. Yeah. Spread about. Yeah, you and Bo. Bo. <laughs> well, then then that would make it about five yards of mulch. I got to go spread yeah. because. <laughs> I'll spread whatever I got, and then I got to go back and where he yeah. randomly shovel stuff. Oh, that's out all right. Or, that's all right. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, it's better to have him help you and put in the extra work. Oh, he was mad. We did it all morning. Yeah, because I think Lacey had ordered I don't know seven yards or something, yeah. and we did it all morning. And then I came up here for this, and he was. I want to go outside. Yeah, I'm like just give me an hour, and then we'll be. Yeah, we'll be back he, outside. He wants to be outside. He put his, he put his, he came out yesterday. He came inside for something. Oh, he mowed the lawn. So he's going to be with me on the mower when we're yeah. mowing. He had a pair of shorts on. So he wanted to get his work pants on to, when we finished mowing the lawn, we we're going to go put some mulch out. And uh, he uh, comes inside and wants to get his work pants on. I'm like, all right. So he comes inside. And he disappeared for like 15 minutes and pretty soon he comes out and he didn't even tell, he went upstairs and Lacey was like, well, what are you doing? He's like, I'm putting my work pants on. He comes outside. They're, <laughs> they're on perfectly backwards. <laughs> the, the back pockets are in the front, the zipper's in the back. He's bending over to do stuff and I can see his underwear because the zipper's, <laughs> nothing's zipped or I let him be. I was like, we'll go do the... Oh, yeah, who cares? We'll do the, he's who bending cares? over At by At least the, he dressed himself, so... He's bending over by the road. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, that, you look like crisscross. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still doing that stuff, so... They must, that Shirts they inside out with Couldn't the, have been comfortable, yeah. but... Yeah, his back pockets are right in the front. He comes yeah. walking across the yard, yard, and I'm like, 
what pants are you wearing? What kind of pants did they see? Yeah. I woke up like, oh my God, they're, his jeans are backwards. Yeah. He's like, dad, I'm ready. Yeah. Like, All right. Grab a shovel. Yeah. So, not ready. Yeah. I guess that's it. That's it. If nothing you, else. Yep. You say it's. I got nothing else. Yeah. Time to go take care of some stuff. So. Yeah. Till next time, get outside. It's good for the soul. See ya. See ya.